Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to try and give some headlines from two reports that Sarah Consulting has conducted on behalf of JISC as part of the Spotlight project. Uh, both reports are literature reviews trying to gather together the state of knowledge on what the latest research and literature tells us about user discovery behavior and increasingly the library response to um, what that research uh, tells us. We published the first report in November 2013 and uh, more recently two years later in autumn of 2015 we've updated uh, that work. Uh, our remit was to focus on university users in the categories of students, teachers and researchers, so not external users for example. Um, uh, in practice most of the research that we found focused on students and researchers. There's very little uh, literature about uh, staff or indeed postgrad students as teachers and how they went about resource discovery. That was true in 2013, remains true now, and although there are some passing references to that in the report, there's really a lot to, to be said uh, about it. Uh, so we'll focus mainly on students and researchers um, in these headlines. Um, the 2013 report, in the 2013 report, we were able to abstract from the literature a list of 14 resource discovery channels that users typically used and we developed some categorization of these across the different stages of education. We nicked um, the terms for different stages of education from the JISC funded visitors and residents research uh, which I'll mention again in a moment uh, but really it's about talking about uh, looking how the use of tools developed from students just starting out on their uh, university career through to more advanced students, um, postgrads and early career researchers and then fully established uh, researchers. Um, and as I say, there was some differentiation across those uh, categories, although also quite a lot um, in common. Um, and the main really uh, thing that was in common across the categories was that users use the tools that are most convenient for them. Um, that obviously changed a bit as they became more embedded in research workflows and, and habits and communities and networks and so on. Um, but convenience really um, uh, did uh, rule. Um, number of caveats about this research, of which perhaps the most um, significant apart from the thing about teaching, which I mentioned, is also that uh, Virtually all the research at this stage, it's changed slightly since, but virtually all the research at this stage was based upon user self-reporting of what they did, and the very little by way of ethnographic studies actually studying what users actually did in close uh, detail when they search for um, resources. Um, so uh, this slide is the list of the 14 resource discovery channels. Um, and uh, no surprise that uh, general search engines and Google services feature uh, large in those. Um, this, the list is not in order of how heavily uh, they are used um, and how heavily these tools are used does vary across different stages of the educational journey from beginning undergraduate through to established career uh, researcher. Um, uh, 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 but there are some things that are in common as I said, uh, for example the use of Google services generally, or maybe other general search engines, um, uh, depending upon co particular cultural context and personal preference, but uh, of some general search engines and also of the more specific Google services such as Google Scholar, using those as starting points for discovery was pretty universal across um, all, all categories. Um, so that's really what we dug out in 2013, um, and as I say, we did try and uh, try and organize this around how the use of these tools evolved across the journey. I'm not going to uh, actually revisit that aspect of the report though you could go and read it if you want to and that's because really it's become less important I think as we um, move into 2015 and beyond. So I'm going to move on uh, sort of very quickly to the 2015 report um, which is organized around five themes uh, that are reflected in the more recent literature over the last two years or so. Um, and the first one of which is directly touches on that point I just mentioned about uh, 
the differentiation of user discovery behavior across different educational stages. I think there's far less of that uh, apparent in the more recent literature than there was in the earlier. Uh, that's not to say there isn't any differentiation, uh, because obviously there is, you know, beginning undergraduates won't use preprint uh, repositories, uh, for example. Um, but it's much less clear, much less clear cut, uh, much more mixed uh, picture. Um, and that partly reflects, I think, um, the well, two things, probably the growth of the uh, discovery layer amongst universe, amongst library tools, and also just the increasing use of uh, Google services, particularly Google Scholar as a starting point um, for discovery. Um, and um, and the, and so you know, our judgment is that online activity is pervasive across all users and also across all age ranges. That's not to say that there are users who aren't resistant to using online tools or find it harder than others and some of that may be age related but really i think we endorse what is the finding of the victors oh, sorry the visitors and residents uh, research that uh, the digital native type paradigm that uh, there are younger people who uh, take take happily to doing things online and older people uh, who are much more insistent. It's much too simplistic a picture these days. There are many, many older people who are very happy and do you know virtually everything online um, and that's uh, so that that picture really is outdated digital natives. Um, the visitors and residents uh, concepts are suggestive um, because they reflect more two types of online behaviour which individuals can adopt in varying mixes um, uh, visitors being when you go online to uh, with some purpose in mind and actually uh, much more goal or instrumentally orientated behavior uh, through to residence behavior where you're actually um, living online connected with other people and uh, maybe conducting resource discovery as part of that so that's a useful uh, way to think about two different ends as it were of a spectrum of online behavior um, and that's sort of uh, something handy to have in the back of um, one's mind. So I think even that sort of simplifies things perhaps a little bit too much for our um, purposes. So you get that pervasive online activity. You have, um, I think what we also find from the literature is the general view that users have much higher expectations, expectations which are not always met, incidentally, but uh, much higher expectations about uh, what they uh, would like to see, what they really expect to see from the services they use, any time access, anywhere access, using any device. Um, it's that sort of seamless access across time, location, uh, devices that they use, uh, which is really the expectation, which is really setting the benchmark um, these days. Um, I think I, mean, I said earlier we found in 2013 that convenience rules, and that's still the case. Um, users very much making strategic decisions about what to use based upon what their purpose is, but also what's handy, what's convenient for them um, to use. And of course, um, much more the case that library tools, I mean, library tools are always part of the ecosystem of discovery. But of course, what we're now finding is that um, the tools that libraries have developed in response to the growth of competitive services, if you want to put it like that, like such as Google Scholar, are also part of the ecosystem and users are making choices about whether to use the library discovery layer, whether to use Google Scholar and so on. And that's um, part of really now of what the research is uh, reflecting. And in that context, I think it is quite suggestive that there, we found some evidence um, uh, that library staff do tend to overestimate the use of library tools uh, by the users. Um, they're a bit too optimistic, I think, about the, the tools that libraries provide. Um, so this table is based upon two surveys uh, which uh, Sarah has been involved in. Uh, one uh, conducted amongst users in, I think it was seven academic libraries uh, in the UK, and the other one was a survey we undertook for JISC in late 20, uh, sort of mid to late 2015 uh, amongst academic library staff and um, because of the way the questionnaires were constructed it's pretty possible to make direct comparisons of the findings so in the case of those if you read across the rows in case of those four um, library services uh, the upper line is 
what users tell us they use and the lower line is what staff believe that users use and you can see um, for example that staff believe that uh, if users want to get the feel for a topic staff believe or about 77 percent of staff believe that users will carry out a general library search to get the feel for a topic but actually only 31 percent of users say that is actually what they would um, do and there are some other um, stark uh, contrasts uh, like that. 49% um, uh, of staff think that users would use union catalogues uh, to find a, a known item, but users uh, say, only 7% of users say that's how they would uh, set about um, doing it. And what a union catalogue uh, meant was, uh, was explained um, uh, in the survey. Um, whether or not users only always know what catalogue they're using is an issue which I'll uh, touch on again um, later. But that I think is quite suggestive about um, the optimism perhaps of staff and the need for close hands-on and localised knowledge uh, about what users uh, actually do. And again I'll touch on that again briefly um, later. The second theme in the report relates to the library role in discovery and there's a fascinating debate in the literature about what the library response should be to the evidence that uh, users don't always use libraries as the starting point for discovery. Um, this is quite a complex issue in some ways um, because if you look at the third bullet point um, on the slide there are of course different types of discovery and the library might feasibly think it has different roles to play in each of those types. So I've highlighted five there, finding a known item, conducting an exploratory search, trying to sort of monitor or keep abreast of a field, a current awareness type of discovery, um, uh, becoming aware of resources through citation chaining and peer peer networks which is um, uh, not, not really a form of monitoring but it's um, uh, or a form of exploratory but it's just a, a way of discovery that you follow on from um, citation to citation um, which some of the literature says has, is an extremely important and sometimes underestimated aspect of discovery and then serendipitous um, discovery um, and there's a debate around how libraries should respond to the evidence that there is about the use of library tools and whether or not libraries should aim to be, whether the strategic aim of libraries should be to be the single starting point for discovery. Um, there's some literature which suggests that libraries never have been, never were the single starting point for discovery in particular, uh, referring back to literature from the 80s uh, which discusses how actually uh, citations in books in particular and also journal articles are always extremely form of discovery and you know, quite separate really from uh, from the library um, but um, there is this debate on how how libraries should respond um, and how they should treat the evidence and uh, indeed uh, the suggestion that if the evidence shows that users are increasingly using other tools such as Google uh, for discovery, it's the right response. It's not necessarily, it might be, but it's not necessarily that the library should just try harder and try to do things more effectively, which some of the literature does seem to be uh, the sort of the automatic response. Um, that libraries need to consider the evidence, consider their investment, consider whether or not in fact um, they need to refine what their role should be. So there's a number of suggestions uh, in the literature which are worth exploring if people are interested in the topic um, that maybe that the focus should be much more on discovering known items and that the other forms of discovery which I mentioned exploratory and monitoring and so on um, uh, libraries should leave by and large to other people to support. Um, that libraries could actually do more around serendipity serendipitous discovery in an online context serendipitous discovery in a physical context while wandering the stacks and the shelves uh, was very easy and nothing in particular had to be done it happened more naturally uh, but some workplaces have um, tried to take steps to design their physical spaces to engineer serendipitous encounter encounters between colleagues because that's of value in the workplace and there is a suggestion in the literature that maybe libraries should think about how they could design their online spaces or their resource uh, lists to um, uh, to uh, promote stimulate uh, serendipitous discovery. Um, 
a suggestion that really uh, the focus should be more on supporting user information skills rather than discovery tools themselves and actually it's about helping your users discover the information they want wherever they might find it whichever tools they might use rather than providing the tools itself um, the suggestion also that actually perhaps libraries should withdraw from discovery altogether that actually the return is not worth the investment that's being made certainly at least one academic library not in the UK but at least one academic library has done this and it has been floated by others um, as a possibility that libraries should withdraw from discovery um, hand it all over to Google and to WorldCat um, give up the discovery layer give up their OPAC uh, eventually uh, and hand it all over to others and just focus on doing other things better um, and um, so a lot of literature and an interesting observation from one commentator that there is a paradox in what libraries are attempting to do that actually particularly as users are becoming more resident online uh, using a range of online services and libraries are trying to plug into those services for example you know, plugging link resolvers into Google Scholar and so on and actually better serving users may mean that the library becomes invisible to them and the libraries may just need to resign themselves to that that um, uh, they may well do a fantastic job which users are, are absolutely dependent upon for finding and accessing the resources they need but it may be completely invisible um, to users and there is a provocative article from an academic in South Africa provocative in a good way I should say um, uh, about how he conducts his research without even having a library user account and how he trains his postgrad students his doctoral students to do exactly the same um, using uh, online tools uh, which is not to say the library doesn't have a role but it's an invisible role um, so there's that fascinating um, debate about what the library role should be and whether or not actually becoming more effective is the only route to go rather than um, trying choosing to do something different. Um, there is also evidence about what the barriers are to effectiveness. So if you think that actually um, you haven't yet given library tours and discovery layer a full go and certainly the evidence on the effectiveness of discovery layers for example is is far from yet being in um, according to the literature anyway um, uh, there is some evidence about uh, what gets in the way of users using these tools effectively um, and it's obvious to say jargon but I think it's um, quite revealing to look at some of that literature uh, and read uh, where people have done some very close surveys of their users and what they've um, discovered is that how basic misunderstandings can persist even after users students have attended library training they can still misunderstand lots of basic library context uh, concepts which are used uh, without thinking and which seem pretty you know very basic bibliographic uh, concepts uh, and misunderstand relationships even things that might seem obvious to 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 uh, people listening to this um, you know what's the difference between an article and a journal what's the difference between a book and a book review um, uh, what's the meaning of different sorts of catalogues understanding um, when you're in the library catalog when you're not in the library catalog all those sorts of things um, get in the way um, there's also, uh, I think, a feeling that libraries, uh, maybe not individually, but collectively could do a lot more about making access seamless across services, across locations, across devices. As I say, this is the expectation now, uh, but there's all sorts of barriers, um, not only about accessing resources on mobile devices, but also what happens if you try to access a resource from a location that's off campus, hitting all sorts of um, uh, authentication wall sometimes sometimes getting authentication sometimes not getting authentication all those sorts of things just get in the way uh, of effectiveness um, uh, a need for more rapid more just-in-time uh, information to users and for more just-in-time support and I think the bottom line and you do see some universities beginning to do this is actually getting to know the peculiarities if you like of local users conducting a very close-grained local ethnographic studies of what your users specifically do you find some universities um, having their eyes opened uh, there's evidence of this literature having their eyes open literally by um, when they rather rely on general surveys like this report but actually uh, conducting uh, that sort of ethnographic survey what do their own students actually do when they're trying to find um, resources and um, and being able therefore to 
better tailor the training that they give and um, and the support that they um, give so two more themes um, there's a little bit about trying to evaluate the effectiveness of library tools uh, as opposed to uh, other tools such as Google Scholar um, I'm sure there's a lot more to be said about this and mostly the research has not yet been done but there is a little bit um, about it and I think this is a useful list that's on this slide from Aaron Tay um, which updates uh, five well, sorry which identifies five things that Google Scholar does better than a discovery layer um, updating more quickly covering more material uh, better coverage of open access better relevancy of results is the claim and also a nice set of supporting features such as the citation features and pointing to related articles um, uh, that's not to say that the advantages go all the one way uh, library discovery tools can be more versatile they can be more convenient for users uh, they can give them more easy access to resources that the library holds but um, there's probably a lot to be learned from the things that Google Scholar does more uh, effectively and as I've said uh, and again this links back to the earlier discussion that well, if you take those lessons and what Google Scholar does more effectively then the question is uh, is the role of the library to compete or to do something uh, completely different um, that's obviously a question for uh, people to consider think about and discuss not uh, not for me to say uh, anything about um, and lastly the report identifies some uh, emerging trends and I've highlighted six here um, first is that discovery is not all about websites um, it's also about apps and um, there are the emergence of some apps for uh, discovering resources not necessarily total academic but academic resources will be in the mix uh, these apps can be topic based they can be locally based um, and that's an, an interesting field MIT some students at MIT have been doing some work around this um, secondly is around uh, what I've called here integrated services so the two things here I think coming together one of which is the growth of uh, music streaming services now there's quite a lot to be learned and, and the previous report touched on this as well about resource discovery from how users discover music um, and there's some interesting work that's been done uh, around that um, but of course the big shift in uh, in the music scene is from paper song to music streaming Spotify and uh, notably and now uh, Apple Music um, and uh, one could think about parallels in the library space I mean why not a, a, a single integrated online library for which um, users can just access the resource uh, that they want online um, uh, whenever they want it um, and uh, there are sort of library ideas around that so the Digital Public Library of America is sort of that sort of idea in embryo um, and there has been discussion in the UK around um, what in the UK has been called a digital public space and the BBC particularly would be floating this idea but also others um, the University of Warwick had a, had a report around this um, and the BBC in discussions around the BBC Charter Renewal was floating the idea of an idea space um, being developed um, which is not just about BBC content but about linking BBC content with content from a wide range of other cultural and artistic providers um, so uh, as something that's uh, emerging may well become significant over the next uh, few years uh, th thirdly mobile is still a huge challenge um, and the horizon the NMC horizon library reports seem to annually identify mobile as being a big challenge which needs to be solved uh, fourthly I just mentioned um, uh, ebook piracy um, not so much because ebook piracy is a big threat because it probably isn't it's probably very small scale um, uh, and not from the point of view that it's a threat to publishers but just that what it tells us about discovery because what it does show is that there are actually some very active and enthusiastic communities of interest around uh, discovering and sharing ebooks illegally um, without copyright restrictions and so on um, either for free or through some sort of shared purchasing model um, and um, it's quite interesting uh, to think about in terms of how you could foster those user communities around you know, very serious scholarly academic books in many in many cases um, uh, and what that can you know what that might show for how uh, users could be engaged and how discovery can be promoted um, fifthly uh, 
I haven't really mentioned social media. There's a bit of evidence, and we'll touch on this in the report, about use of Twitter in particular by academics to share and disseminate research and therefore to discover what your peers are doing, what the latest research is. And that is probably something that's under research, but of some um, significance. There's also um, some evidence around about what students, young young people um, use in terms of social media uh, and where they are. And often it's, well, it rapidly changes, but I mean, often it conflicts with um, what the preconceptions might be. So, for example, Instagram is far more significant, it seems, than Facebook um, at the moment. Um, and of course, new tools are coming along all the time. And also, I think of significance is where this is leading us in terms of things such as interface developments. So if you think about Tinder, the dating application, um, just in terms of its simple swipe left, swipe right interface, um, that possibly has significance because it's becoming imitated by other tools um, and may sort of seep into how interfaces are um, designed and uh, discovery in general is carried out uh, in, in the future. And lastly, looking um, to the future, looking beyond the current generation of students uh, to those who are not very far away, those who went to universities in 2020 to 2025. There is already, this is US-based research, but they, some researchers, um, more with a commercial angle, but nevertheless is of interest, have done some focus groups with users as young as eight in the US about how they live online. Um, and we already have it at universities, of course, uh, people who have never known a world without the internet. Um, what we will have is uh, users who um, for whom online acting online is just seamless with acting offline um, they, they, there's very little differentiation between the two these are users also for whom a mouse if you've got universities with uh, libraries pcs with mice these are users who often have never used a mouse wouldn't know what to do with one because it's all touch interfaces and to an extent and perhaps increasingly gesture interfaces. Um, they tend to be very instrumental in what they do and highly visual and it's not clear to what extent that's due to their stage of cognitive development and to what extent that's a habit which will last through to when they arrive at university as more mature um, learners. Um, but the research reports that you know almost universally these are people who will conduct a natural language search on Google and as soon as a page of results uh, pop up, they will flip to the um, images um, tab rather than read the text. And that may be because they're more interested in shopping or finding images than they are in finding um, more scholarly resources. And of course, but um, if it's something that becomes deeply ingrained, it's something that probably for scholarly work would need to be um, uh, trained out of them, as it were. Um, uh, and also, I th other things to say is that uh, they very much want to personalise and curate uh, res uh, their resources. So those aspects of personalisation, self-curation, are highly important um, for these these users. Um, so that's what the research is uh, showing uh, uh, currently. Um, I would encourage you, if you're interested in any of that, to go and look at the report. There's quite a lot of references listed in the report, uh, which will lead you into the literature. Uh, and there's some really interesting uh, stuff there, I think, and some really thought-provoking stuff, um, which I hope you'll find of interest. And that's me done. Thanks very much.